It's Friday, the 12th of May in paradise. I'm in the wrong car. And it causes all sorts of upset and discombobulation. I've just given the woman in the paper shop the voucher for Thursday because I was babysitting yesterday so I didn't go to work. So, so I said to her I'll just come back to the car and get the right one, the Friday one. Not that she can't cash it in, I mean you know. I'll give them twice as many vouchers as I take papers out of the shop. And uh, of course I'm in the wrong car, so the vouchers aren't even in here are they? And not only that, I don't have any change in this car either. So I've had to act like the Queen and try and scrape together two quid <laughs> out of the change I just happened to have in my pocket, which is en route to some pot or other. Anyway, good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. How are you? I hope you're well. We've had a bit of rain here overnight. We've got low cloud, low cumulus. Uh, but it's warm and the rain's, you know, really accelerated everything so everything's going like mad which is a pain because I've run out of red diesel so all the grass in the field's grown out of control so I've got to, um, the trouble is my tank is so old and rickety and made out of metal and just about to leak that the uh, oil people cause a real fuss when uh, they come and you know, oh yeah, I shouldn't really deliver it. Is it double bunded? No, you know, it's been up there since World War II. Oh well, you know, regulations, blah blah blah. So, what you do is you just have to stand there patiently, waiting for them to work it through, work the problem through, okay? Which is either they disqualify your tank and sort of refuse to fill it and go back to the depot with the diesel that they've driven all the way over to you and explain to their manager why they decided to on a point of principle not deliver it because in their opinion my tank wasn't safe enough but historically I mean you know a new installation obviously has to be has to have a double skin etc etc but the old installations, the ones that have been there since the year dot, they are, for the most part, you know, it's not like everyone had to upgrade on a certain day. So they can, they can continue to use facilities that are in use. But they moan. And some of them moan more than others. You know, you know like when you're on a train and the ticket collector comes along and he says, uh, can I see your rail card? And you're like, oh God. You know, I've got one, I've got one. And so, the shame, you know, you go make this big play of getting a rail card out of your briefcase, which is in the overhead rack. And then, very occasionally, very, like once every two years or something, one of them will say, can you take it out of the wallet? Because <laughs> they want to check the signature on the back to make sure that you're not you know, using somebody else's rail card who need to be the same gender as you because obviously your first name's on it so I can't have a, you know, Jane Angry on my, my rail card it'd have to be another bloke's rail card but they don't really want to check the signature they just want to see if it's signed because if it's not signed, it's not valid did you know that? well there you go, it's not if you get a rail card and you don't sign the back then it's not a valid rail card and if you produce it on request and it's unsigned they can refuse to accept it now what most people do is they say oh uh, well if you've got a pen I'll sign it now but oh no that is not sufficient of course the whole point of signing it is to avoid fraud isn't it it's so that the original owner signs it so that when person B tries to use it he can't reproduce the original signature well of course if you left it blank, which you you know your forward-thinking criminal would do, then whoever got caught with it would be able to say, "Oh, just give us a pen and I'll sign it." And of course, that way, the 
the, they, they, they get around the signature check, don't they? Not that, I mean, you know, this is hypothetical, theoretical fraud. I mean, you know, that this is the real edge cases on the system. So, so then they spend five minutes lecturing you on the fact that it's not, uh, you know, it's not signed on the back and it's not, uh, theoretically, it's not valid card and, well, they shouldn't really, you know, accept it, but, you know, if, by then, if you're sensible, you'll have just got a pen and signed it. Just said, turn it, just say to the bloke next year, have you got a pen? But it's signed. And they're not going to do anything about it, you know, because in the same way as the bloke who delivers my oil, he's not going to refuse to deliver it, but you you need to let them work it through in their brain. Is this sensible? And, and what I'm doing is what I am doing sense and what I'm doing is it sensible you know am I am I acting like a complete idiot and some people know that they are and don't care because they are like a statutory body it's the law or they are just need a bit of time to think it through and that's the oil the oil man needs time to think it through and I haven't had anyone refuse, you know, or the other thing they say is, oh, no, it's not, you know, you know how much, do you know how much diesel weighs? So I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I suppose you do, though. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, it's about a tonne a tonne. <laughs> so, so you're like, okay, then. Well, yeah, you've got it on hardball, haven't you? You've got it up on cardboard. It's not, that won't take the weight. So I only want half a tank. So it's only half the weight. Well, I haven't seen you for a while. Who have you been taking diesel off? Boiler juice? <laughs> no. <laughs> I've just decided to cut down on my diesel usage because you are such a pain in the ass every time you come. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, why bother? You know, if a patient you've got to think these things through and, and fortunately you know most of what goes on in the dental surgery we've seen before haven't we we can think these things through faster than the than the patient oh excuse me just have to put it in uh, Jackie X mode because I'm pulling out a death junction I don't want to get a move on yeah so you know if a patient turns up a bit early, don't say to them, oh, you're a bit early. <laughs> you can say to them, oh, you're nice and early, but don't say, oh, you're a bit early. Because <laughs> they're like, they'll be like, okay, let, let me think you, I'll wait and let you think this through. <laughs> Are you going to refuse to see me because I'm early? No. So what's the point of saying it then? Off topic, but it's the weekend of the Eurovision Song Contest. It's an annual festival for those people in the population who've got one Y and two X chromosomes. And uh, I've just listened to the British entry, which is about as far as I'm going to get, really, because I don't watch it. Uh, well, my nurse does. She, you know, stays up late with a frozen curly whirly and. Uh, as fun, but I don't know. I don't know. I, I mean, you know. I mean, it's easy to say that I don't think we're going to do very well this year. But I, I don't know. If if you look at the entry, it's a girl singing, and it's quite a. I just don't know whether they've thought this through. This is the you know, on the theme of thinking things through, right? because it's it's a lovely vocal number and she's got an excellent voice but it, I would not have put that up as our entry and I'll tell you why and I, this is talking completely as someone who doesn't know what he's talking about it's a massive venue it's a massive stage it's a big occasion it's a lot to ask for one person to be no perfect on an occasion like that. It's all very well being brilliant in rehearsals and brilliant in the semi-finals and that, but once you know that that's it, this is the one and only performance of your life and, you know, there is a tendency to sort of uh, 
lorry's pulled over. I wanted to know why. On the motorway. You know, it's a big ask. And then secondly, it's sort of a quite a soft vocal number. It doesn't have a big backing. She hasn't got um, Amberdink's voice or Jones's voice. Uh, if you look at the video, the video is actually more suited to the number, which is got a lot of very, very tightly focused headshots and uh, a real sort of quite a lot of post processing of the vocals to make it, you know, like a, a young girl singing, singing a song. But if you look at her on the Eurovision stage, you can't see her. <laughs> She's, uh, there's only one of her. There's no, there's no backing singers like they were last year uh, and she just sit, stands out there and sing this song and it's only got four notes it's like a child could play it on a children's xylophone it's got so few notes it just goes up and down and up and down and up and down over these four notes again so I don't see how people are going to be wowed by this you know they're not going to come away saying oh because I mean it's got a bit of emotional um, uh, how can I put it it's got an emotional hook it's got a sort of an emotional message but not really relevant to anything like uh, Euro Eurovision -y, you know or it's not it's pretty downbeat and the message is um, not very complex and it's got, you know, you get, <laughs> it sort of evokes about as much emotion in the average viewer as wondering whether the cloakroom is going to lost your, lost your coat, I would imagine, on the day. So, you know, notwithstanding the, you know, the political voting, which is always amusing, the day we start winning Eurovision again, I shall... I should start to worry because that means we are we're doing something <laughs> that Europe likes and that must that by definition will be wrong we um, uh, the, the Association had that sort of relationship with the Department of Health uh, my predecessor Amalak Singh was a tremendously social character and got invited to everything every every uh, political and social gathering that was going on and uh, in return he uh, arranged like a, a political social gathering on behalf of the association to which everybody attended chief dental officer everybody you know british dental association chief executive all pitched up and then um because that was the quid pro quo you know i mean there's a group of about 100 of them and everybody had the authority to organize a party and everybody went to everybody's party it was only polite and um, it was a bit like <laughs> when I was a young boy we went down the pub we had eight pints of beer there was four of us so it was two rounds each it was easy we knew exactly what we were gonna get to drink eight pints we knew exactly what we were gonna have to buy two rounds <laughs> very egalitarian and uh, Amalak was the toast he was a socialite. He was the toast of the social scene, the dental, uh, the quail's egg scene in London. But then when I came along, I'm uh, very different, very different. Said to the council straight out that you're going to get a very different person as chief executive if you if you elect me. You know, you're. I'll tell you straight away. I don't think that Amalak is his approach is very successful. It's very successful if you like parties and get, getting along, going along to get along. And he's very successful and, uh, you know, uh, uh, being able to ring people up and being friendly with people. But he's achieved nothing. He's not achieved anything. I said, my emphasis is going to be much more on achieving stuff, you know, changing, making change, improving things, uh, terms and conditions for our members. And that's going to involve putting pressure on people and telling them that uh, we don't agree and that we don't uh, think that they're doing it things the right way uh, or that they're making a mistake although they haven't thought things through <laughs> this does not make you popular 
not you know and so I think I was a bit of a shock to the to quail's egg uh, society and uh, very quickly got uninvited to everything and uh, and in return uh, was not all that bothered about putting on uh, the, the old uh, social events myself however we did make progress for the first time in a long time and uh, you know we started we were a bit more hard-hitting you know with the um, doctors and dentists review body and but the, the problem was in the long term I think that you just get uh, you know the establishment I've always said uh, deals with serious threats by eliminating you by sort of process of just pretending you don't exist and everybody in quails egg society knows to do the same so they're very quickly warned that you're association non grata and um, we get the Eurovision Song Contest treatment null point <laughs> null mentions null parties no yeah well that's the trouble isn't it with roundabouts and if you're behind someone then that's where you are behind them yeah so anyway I mean I wish the girl luck that's all I can say I hope she does well and if we win you can email me can't you and say what's he you're not very prescient about this Eurovision thing you know you were wrong about that in fact if I'm wrong about anything let me know I mean I, I, I mean that I do want to know because uh, my internally consistent model of the world is um, is predicated on being updated as and when the, the, an edge case doesn't go how I predicted so we've got one big job in today we've got a guy who's coming in to have um, his teeth out and eight implants put in I think and some two acrylic superstructures on the chrome framework so I'm not doing the work I'm just observing but uh, our implantologist is doing the work but that should be exciting And it's, I think it, I've got a crown fit to do and a, a woman who's um, got some decay underneath her crown. So I took the crown off, removed the decay and stuck the crown back on for her and thought, oh, I've done her a real favour there because, you know, no new, no core required, no new crown required, etc. No root treatment required and um, now she's coming in with toothache. So that's an interesting question there because uh, you know you have to make sure that they understand that it's them that's trying to save the tooth not you you're just doing the work um, I'm sure she understands that we had a woman in uh, day before yesterday who uh, wanted to see the hygienist but wasn't brushing her teeth and so I've asked her to come back in four weeks time so we can just check that she's brushing her teeth and um, I don't think she um, will be, or she might be, but she's doing it so that she she can see the hygienist. Uh, she's one of these people that believes that it's the hygienist's job to brush and clean people's teeth, and uh, wants you know and doesn't is not happy with the scale and polish because you've only cleaned the teeth that needed cleaning and not all the teeth. She wants all the teeth cleaned, not just the ones that you know have got the scale. So that's why she wants to see the hygienist. And, but she's on the preventive scheme because she's obviously, you know, keen and motivated about oral health. But she's got this this odd attitude, which you don't see that often. But you have to pick it up when you do, which is that she would be better off off a preventive scheme. She'd be better off on a pay-as-you-go basis this well because she basically just wants to subcontract her cleaning to someone else. And if a patient wants to subcontract any part of their care of their mouth to you then that's a big red flashing light and they shouldn't be on a preventive scheme they should be on a pay-as-you-go where they can subcontract it as much as they like and obviously they just pay the cost so that's my tip for the day wish us luck with the implants I'll let you know how it went but have a nice weekend and I'll talk to you Monday bye